Welcome back to our class on reaching new levels of faith. As I mentioned in the last class, we're to that portion of our study where we get to make practical application through Bible characters. We looked at Peter in lesson eight, and now in lesson nine, we're gonna look at Job and the practical struggle. Now with Peter, I kind of walked you through and kind of left you guessing what his struggle was. With Job, there's no question about it. The entire book of Job is about the practical struggle. And the practical struggle is where we're really wrestling with, is it practical to serve God? If I serve God and I do the right things and bad things happen anyway, which is what happened to Job, then you know, what's the point? And the whole book is designed around answering that question. And so I am really looking forward to this study. Let's jump right in to Job chapter one. If you'll turn there in your Bible, hopefully you can get a Bible in front of you. And also if you can get your workbook, your, your student handbook and be able to follow along and fill in the blanks. We're looking at Job and the practical struggle. Let's look at who Job was as a person you know, as the book opens up in Job chapter one and verse one, it says, now there was a certain man in the land of Uz whose name is Job. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Look at the description of him. Blameless, upright, fearing God, turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all of the men of the East. That's quite a compliment for Job. I also want to throw in here in chapter 4 as he, his friend Eliphaz is describing him. Notice what Eliphaz says about Job in verse 3 of chapter 4. Behold, you have admonished many and have strengthened weak hands. Your words have helped the tottering to stand, and you have strengthened feeble knees." That just goes to show what kind of man Job was. It's obvious Job loved God and he served mankind. He served his fellow man. And so this is a very, very good man. Now turning back to chapter one, let's see what happens to this man Job. Starting in verse six of chapter one, it says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on us. Sounds like first Peter chapter five, verse eight, doesn't it? Where it says that Satan is a roaring lion sinking for someone to devour. He says, I've been roaming around on the earth. Verse eight, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him, a blameless and upright man, fearing God, turning away from evil. And then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land, but put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He'll surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. First time that I read the book of Job as a young Christian, maybe you can relate to this. I thought, man, poor Job. He's like this innocent little pawn in this giant spiritual chess match. And I thought, this is so unfair, so unjust. But I want to point out something here. Notice the way that God talks about Job. He says, have you considered my servant Job? It's obvious that God is proud of Job. And so all that's about to happen is not a punishment for Job. There's a purpose behind it, just like it is a lot of time when we go through suffering as he's about to go through. We think, oh man, God is punishing me. God must hate me. No, that's not the case at all. Punishment or, or excuse me, pain and suffering 
I know a lot of times when we're going through it, we don't see the good that could possibly come from it. But often later on, I know this has been my experience, when I've been through times of intense pain in my life, later on I found out I did learn a very valuable lesson from it. And Job's about to learn a very valuable lesson as well. Verse 13 says, Now when the day, on the day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them and slew the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell the young people, and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, and he tore his robe, and he shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my father's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God? I want to take the focus off of Job for just a minute. And let's look at Satan. Look at the way Satan is approaching all this. Satan is having this conversation with God, which is fascinating just to begin with, to think that, that God is even talking with Satan. But Satan is, is saying where he's been. He's been on the earth. And, and God says, have you... Come across Job down there, man, he's, he's doing good. And Satan says, you know, well, the reason he's being so good is because you've been so good to him. I'm obviously paraphrasing here a lot, but, but you get to the point that Satan's idea of how to get people to turn away from God is by sending suffering and hardship. He believed that suffering and hardship could make people turn away from God, and that is his plan with Job. And so he says to God, just, just let me take the stuff away from him, all these good things that you've given him. He'll surely curse you to your face. Well, we see in the next chapter, in chapter 2, that Satan realizes that didn't work. In fact, uh, we saw there at the end of chapter 1 the response that Job had to his suffering he fell down and he worshiped God, verse 20. And he said, I, I came to this earth naked. I came with nothing. I'm going to leave with nothing. The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. A tremendous attitude for someone who's just lost so much. And he did not blame God in all of his suffering. So let's see what happens next. In chapter 2, it says, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, says, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. Now, I want to pause there and point out when he says without cause, God doesn't mean from his point of view. He means from Job's point of view. From Job's point of view, there doesn't seem to be a reason for why all this is happening. This is from Job's perspective. Verse 4, Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand now and touch his bones and his flesh, and he'll curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your power. 
only spare his life. You notice who's in charge here. This isn't a one-to-one -one battle between Satan and God, good and evil. God is obviously the more powerful one. Satan has to ask permission to do anything that he does. But here is an instance where Satan, representative of evil, is trying to pull Job away from God, trying to destroy his faith. And he believes he can do this. Well, taking away his stuff didn't work. Well, if you would just strike his flesh, then he would go ahead and curse you. Reading on in verse 7, it says, Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, and he smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a potsherd to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. You know, Satan tried to prove how easy it was to have faith when all was well. But God, if you would just take all this stuff away from Job then he will surely curse you. If you would strike his flesh, then he would curse you. And so Satan chooses boils of all things to inflict Job with. Now, I'm going to put up a picture here, and I'm going to just tell you, if you're squeamish, you may want to look away because it's not a pretty picture. But... Whenever somebody has boils, this is what it looks like. And Job describes his condition in Job 7 verse 5 when he says, My body is clothed with worms and scabs. My skin is broken and festering. And this is what boils look like. Okay, we'll take the picture away. You can look back if you want. I could have actually got more graphic pictures than that. I saw pictures of children with boils all over their bodies, all over their faces, up in their nose, in their ears. Boils can actually get on the inside of your mouth, even down in your throat, and they, they can choke you. It's a horrible, horrible thing to live with. And here is Job, and he is inflicted with this head-to-toe boils, or carbuncles as we call them today. He's sitting in ashes and he is scraping himself with potsherd, which is broken pieces of pottery. Not the, the best way to treat boils, by the way. Not the, the preferred medical treatment of a condition like that. But he is obviously in tremendous pain. And I think it's important to understand all the conversation as you're reading this. Think about Job and his condition. Not only has he lost his herds and his crops. Not only has he lost his kids, he's now lost his health. He has nothing but four befuddled servants and a wife. And I think it's pretty obvious why God or why Satan did not take her away. She is obviously trying to discourage him. Why don't you curse God and die, she says. But here he is suffering and his friends come to sit with him and to comfort him. You know, it's during hard times that we often feel like God is allowing us to suffer beyond our limits. And when we read as they are conversing, Job says in chapter 6 of the book of Job, in verse 11, What is my strength that I should wait? And what is my end that I should endure? Is my strength the strength of stones? Or is my flesh bronze? Is it that my help is not within me and that deliverance is driven from me? For the despairing man, there should be kindness from his friend. He's talking about his friends who have come to comfort him, and so far they've not been a great comfort to him. So he does not forsake the fear of the Almighty. My brothers have acted deceitfully like a wadi, like the torrents of wadis which vanish. A, a, a wadi is a stream, but it is seasonal. And so you go to get a drink, it might have a drink, might not. He said, that's how my friends are. They're not, they're not very dependable. He's going through hard times. And he, he feels like, I, I don't have the strength 
to withstand this. It's too hard for me. Look at chapter 9. And we're obviously not going to read all of the book of Job. You can do that on your own. But I just want to highlight this and hopefully pique your interest enough. You're going to want to go back and read this and see this practical struggle that Job is going through. Look at chapter 9, verse 1. Then Job answered, In truth, I know that this is so. But how can a man be in the right before God? If one wished to dispute with him, he could not answer him once in a thousand times. Wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has defied him without harm? Job's struggle is with, is it worth it to obey God? This is exactly what the practical struggle is. That's what we call the practical struggle. And if you read through, you'll see Job is questioning things. He's not accusing God of wrongdoing. He's saying, God, I wish I could speak with you about this. I wish we could talk because I have some questions about this struggle and I don't understand why I'm going through this pain and suffering right now. Now, there's something that contributed to the suffering that Job went through. Not only was his suffering physical, but there was something going on in his, what I'll call his theology, that made it even worse. Your theology is your understanding of God. How you perceive God and what kind of God you think He is and how He reacts to what you do, that's all involved in your theology. And in chapter 10, Job says this. Well, let's start in verse 9. It says, Remember now, you have made me as clay, and would you turn me into dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese, clothe me with skin and flesh, and knit me together with bones and sinews. You have granted me life and loving kindness, and your care has preserved my spirit. Yet these things you have concealed in your heart. Now look at how he talks about God. I know that this is within you. If I sin, then you would take note of me, and you would not acquit me of my guilt. If I am wicked, woe to me. If I am righteous, I dare not lift up my head. I am sated with disgrace and conscious of my misery. Should my head be lifted up, you would hunt me like a lion. And again, you would show your power against me. Now look at the way that Job is talking about God. Is this really accurate about God? I mean, Does he conceal these things in his heart? Does God not share with us how he feels about us? Uh, Does he really not acquit us of our guilt? Does he really hunt us down like a lion? Job has a false theology. He has this concept of God that is skewed, that is wrong. And because of that, that makes his suffering even worse. You know, a lot of times I hear people today talk about, well, that God, that God of the Old Testament, Uh, He was a mean God. First of all, it's the same God. God didn't become a Christian in the New Testament. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And if you think that he was a mean God in the Old Testament, you might want to go back and read your Old Testament. And this time, look at the way that the people who lived under this God in the Old Testament, how they talked about him. Did you know that Nehemiah once said in Nehemiah 9 verse 17 says, But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. When Nehemiah said that, they were in captivity. God had abandoned them first to the Babylonians and then to the Medo-Persians. He says, man, you are such a gracious God. How could he say that? Because he understood the reason they were in that position was not God's fault. God had warned them what would happen if... The people were not faithful to him. God was just honoring his promise. He didn't think God was mean and unjust and fair. Quite the contrary. He saw him as compassionate. He'd actually been very slow to anger. He'd been very patient with them, but they persisted in their sin. And when we persist in our sin, there's a point where God says, okay, if that's what you want, then that's what I will give you. Job perceived this injustice in the world, and that also made it tough for Job because he saw the righteous suffering while the wicked seemed to be going unharmed. In chapter 12 and verse 4, it says, I'm a joke to my friends. 
the one who called on God and he answered him, the just and the blameless man is a joke. He who is at ease holds calamity in contempt as prepared for those whose feet slip. The tents of the destroyers prosper and those who provoke God are secure, whom God brings into their power. Job's saying, when I look at the world, I see people who are doing the righteous thing and they suffer, like me, for instance, is what Job would say. And then I see the wicked people over there and they're doing all sorts of terrible things and nothing bad ever happens to them. Well, first of all, that's not accurate. When we see people who are living wicked lives, if you think that they don't have any problems, man, you need to look closer. <laughs> they got a lot of problems. And just like they go through struggles like we do, but they don't even have an answer. They have no place to turn. We have God at least. We have a, a place that we can go to seek help and to, to ask God to forgive us and to ask God to help make things right. They don't have that. So when we perceive this injustice, which is really not there, then that intensifies our suffering. Now, in addition to that, his comforters, his friends also had problems in their theology. In 22, Job chapter 22, we see Eliaphaz. And look what he says, starting in verse 4. Is it because of your reverence that he reproves you? That he enters into judgment against you? Is it because you're such a good guy, Job, that, that God is punishing you? Is not your wickedness great and your iniquities without end? For you have taken a pledge of your brothers without cause and stripped men naked. To the weary you have given no water to drink, and from the hungry you have withheld bread. But the earth belongs to the mighty men, and the honorable man dwells in it. You have sent widows away empty, and the strength of the orphans has been crushed. Therefore snares surround you, and sudden dread terrifies you. Now this is Eliphaz, the same Eliphaz that back in chapter 4 said, what a great guy Job is. And he says, now is his tune has changed. He says, man, these terrible things that are happening to you, it's obviously because you're wicked. Now go ahead and confess up, Job. Tell us what your wickedness is. What a comforter, huh? His theology is wrong. He assumes that if bad things happen to you, it's because God is punishing you. We have a perfect example in the New Testament where... Jesus at one point was with his disciples and they were in Jerusalem and they'd heard about some Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. He'd mixed them with a pagan sacrifice to insult them. And Jesus asked this question, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you all will likewise perish. And then there was another instance where some of the, the people were walking through one of the cities and the Tower of Siloam fell on them and killed 18 of them. And so Jesus asked them about that. Do you suppose that those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you likewise will all perish. What's Jesus saying? Just because a tower falls on people doesn't mean that, that they were worse sinners. Sometimes towers just fall on people, and it's not because they sin. There was another instance in John chapter 9 where his disciples saw a man who was blind, and they said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? What kind of a question is that? In the next verse, verse 3, Jesus said, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the work of God might be displayed in him. People, sometimes bad things just happen. It's not because God is punishing you. Now there is punishment for sin. There's no question. And there are times when we sin and we suffer the consequences of it. But sometimes bad things just happen because it's a bad world. It's an evil world. And just because something bad is happening in your life doesn't mean that God's trying to punish you. But Eliaphaz had that faulty theology. He believed that Job was suffering because he had sinned. 
Now, another interesting passage in chapter 29. Keep in mind the suffering that Job is going through, uh, the emotional loss of his family, his physical suffering as he's sitting there covered with boils that are festering. Sometimes when we go through a hard time, we start reflecting back on the good times. And that's what Job does in chapter 29 and verse 2. He says, Oh, that I were as in months gone by, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone over my head, and by his light I walked through darkness, as I was in the prime of my days, when the friendship of God was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, and my children were around me. He's remembering his lost children. When my steps were bathed in butter and the rocks poured out from me streams of oil. When I went out of the gate of the city and when I took my seat in the square and the young men saw me and hid themselves and the old men rose and stood and the princes stopped talking, put their hands on their mouths. The voice of the nobles were hushed and their tongue stuck to their palate. For when the ear heard, it called me blessed. And when the eye saw, it gave witness of me. During the practical struggle, when we're really trying to figure out, is it worth it to follow God? Sometimes we reflect back on the good times. And that actually can be a very good thing. We don't want to live in the past. This could kind of look back and say, yeah, God is able to bless me. And he's able to, to do things that are helpful for me. And it, it helps to reaffirm our trust in God. These friends of Job, they, they go back and forth with Job and he answers. But there's a young man named Elihu. He's sitting back and he's watching all that. And he doesn't say anything for a long time. And then finally, he speaks up. And he says something that's pretty important here. In chapter 34 of Job, in verse 5, it says, For Job has said, I am righteous, but God has taken away my right. Should I lie concerning my right? My wound is incurable, though I am without transgression. What man is like Job? So these are the things that Job has said, and now this is what Elihu is saying in reply to that. What man is like Job, who drinks up derision like water, who goes in company with the workers of iniquity and walks with wicked men? For he has said, it profits a man nothing when he is pleased with God. Look at this statement. This is the epitome of the practical struggle. This is Elihu's interpretation of what Job is saying. It profits a man nothing when he is pleased with God. What he's saying is, Job, you're acting like it. there's no purpose in serving God. This is the practical struggle. Verse 10 says, Therefore listen to me, you men of understanding, far be it from God to do the wickedness, and from the Almighty to do wrong, for he pays a man according to his work and makes him find it according to his way. Surely God will not act wickedly, and the Almighty will not pervert justice, who gave him authority over the earth, and who has laid him on him the whole world. If he should determine to do so, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together. All man would return to dust. What's uh, Elihu saying here? He's saying, really? Are you sure God's been unfair here? Is God unfair if he allows us to lose something which was never ours to begin with? Remember, everything that we have is really God's. And if we've offered it up to God, if he puts things in our possession or he takes things away, it's all God's anyway. God's not unfair. You know, Elihu says if he really was fair, if he really treated us the way that he should, and if he withdrew his spirit and his breath, we would all perish altogether. God actually is good. We just sometimes don't see that good. And we don't see it when we go through pain and struggling, and I understand that. I didn't. I, I remember a time when I went through a great deal of pain in my life. And if he came up to me during that time and says, God's going to work this out for the good, I would have said, I don't really see that happening right now. Now, you would have been right. Later on, a good did, did come from the suffering that was in my life. But it took a long time for me to see that. But if you had this skewed picture of God, if you think that he's 
mean and angry and he's just out to get you, that makes things so much worse. You need to reshape your theology and align it with the true God of the Bible who does love you and care about you very much. One last thing about when we go through the practical struggle and clear at the end, the 42nd chapter. This is after God has come and has actually spoken to Job and asked him so many questions that Job just, just blew his mind. There's no way he could answer them. We, with all of our modern uh, knowledge and technology, can an not answer a lot of these questions that, that God asked to Job. But in the end, here's Job's attitude. In Job chapter 42, verse 1, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear now, and I will speak, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of your ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. In the end, after Job had been through all this, it really humbled him when he understood who God is. It humbled him to even think that he could question such a wonderful God. You know, in times of struggle, and this is an important lesson to learn, humility will lead you back to God. Pride always leads away from God. Humility leads toward God. And in the end, that's what kept Job faithful, was his humility, his true humility. And especially when he saw what a wonderful God God truly is and amazing. We don't always understand what's going on in our lives. We sometimes have that practical struggle where, is it really worth it to go through all this? But if you'll step back and look at the bigger picture and understand who God is and understand that even though you may not see everything that God is doing at the time, God really does have a purpose and an end for you. You know, there's so much more to teach you. We haven't even gotten to solidifying faith. I want to do that in our next class, and so I hope you'll be here for that. But what I just showed you in Peter and in Job, this is something you can do all the way through the Bible. You can go through and you can identify these levels of faith in these characters of the Bible. And you can see how they transgressed and or how they, excuse me, how they transgressed in their faith, transitioned. There's the word I was looking for. They transitioned in their faith. And you can also see the struggles that they went through. They struggled, they were people just like you and me but they were able to move forward. And I want you to move forward also in your faith. I hope you'll be here for the next class as we talk about how to solidify your faith. Thank you for being with us today.